Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our speaker mind today. I am super excited to introduce you to Stephanie Chung. I'm gonna give a bit of her background before I start um, asking her to share her stories and lessons with us. Um, so welcome to everyone and a reminder that you can ask questions as we go along. We have some um, topics to discuss with Stephanie, of course, um, but we love to interact with you and what's on your mind. So feel free to use the Zoom chat and I'll be taking a look at that periodically and make sure if we have some questions that I can integrate them into the conversation with Stephanie today. So Stephanie, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, thank you. I always say I'll answer any question except for how much do I weigh? Oh, well, that's good. So we're not let gonna those questions rip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we know we have a very short list to stay away from then. And I agree with you. Don't you dare ask me that question. Um, I wanna introduce Stephanie for a minute so that our uh, participants understand you know, who she is and why it was so amazing that she would agree to come on Speaker Mind. I mean, Stephanie is running and help running um, a, a company right now, uh, Wheels Up, that is in aviation. And, you know, we all have a lot to learn about that industry and how it's changing and transforming. Um, but she's also the first African American leader in that industry at this level and has been in this industry for a number of years. So it's going to be really enlightening to hear from her about what she not only accomplished, but as we always try to focus on with Speaker Mind is what were the challenges and the obstacles presented so that we can learn from each other and help each other uh, boost what we can accomplish uh, as individuals, women, uh, and, uh, and people. Um, Stephanie's also done some really diverse things with her life because not only is she leading this business, she's also an author, and she's also a motivational speaker. And um, I know several people who have seen and participated in, in the room with Stephanie when she's spoken and think she's incredibly special and have been moved and um, impacted by listening to her approach. And the book that she wrote is called Profit Like a Girl. And Stephanie, you know, I don't think I uh, mentioned this to you before, but um, I know it's been a little bit since you put out that book and it was a best selling book. Um, but I thought the title was so awesome because it basically said, you know, there's nothing wrong with women trying to make money yeah. and doing it really, really well. And as um, I've always believed and have learned in my life, money is about independence for us. It is not necessarily about reaching a place where you can acquire important things or things that you like that are. Um, kind of assets in life, but it's about independence of making choices. It's about freedom. It's about doing what you wanna do, not what your, um, someone else is telling you to do. So we're gonna dig in a little bit about why you wrote a book called Profit Like a Girl and you know, what were some of the key things that you believed to write that. Sure. Um, you know, there's one other thing I want everyone to know about Stephanie and and we'll get to it because she's been so open and um, uh, you know, willing to talk about this with us. But like many women, she is a breast cancer survivor. And that means other types of challenges and obstacles and getting through that. And we'll hear from Stephanie about how she navigated that situation in her life while she was also doing these other amazing things that I just mentioned. And, in advance, we'll say thank you, Stephanie, for being willing to share those kinds of things sure. because our professional lives are not isolated. Our professional lives are just a part of us being women and human. And it means that we have to integrate and, and run our lives in 360 degrees. And sometimes that means personal issues. Sometimes it means health issues. Sometimes that means business issues. So um, we're excited to learn all about you. So let's get started and hear from you directly. <laughs> you know, Stephanie, just, you know, I highlighted some of the accomplishments in your life, but our audience always likes to hear kind of the real deal of who you are. So just tell us a little bit about you're in Dallas now and you're in, you're in Texas, um, yes. in terms of your life, but mm -hmm. where did you grow up and what kind of, you know, um, uh, childhood did you have in terms mm -hmm. of growing up and where in the, 
in the world you were, just to give us a kind of foundation of, of Stephanie. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you for having me, Elisa. I, I, you and I are about a pal. So I think we're going <laughs> to, we're going to have a great girl chat today. Uh, in regards to my upbringing and how I grew up and yes, I do live in Dallas, Texas now, but I'm not from Texas. I always say I'm really not from anywhere because I was a military brat. So uh, a big part of who I am today is because I'm a child of a soldier. Uh, I was one of those kids. My dad was a, uh, a, a an airman, right, for mm -hmm. the U.S. Air Force. And so I grew up around active Air Force bases. And really what that meant is I grew up listening to planes take off and land my entire life. So it's no surprise that I'm actually in aviation because I literally heard planes taking off and landing um, every single day of my life. The other part was because um, being in the military, we would move every two years. And so when I make a comment saying I'm not really from India, yeah, yeah. it's because every two years I had to go, you know, we, my dad was stationed someplace else and we would move to a new state. Um, and then that became my home, right? So growing up as a child and now even as an adult, I call myself, Alisa, a professional new kid because when you're always new, you know, you're the new kid in school, you're the new kid in the neighborhood, you have to, you know, get to learn and, and meet your teachers. Like you're always the one having to adjust and adapt yeah. because you're the one always moving every two years. Right. So as a little kid, I didn't know anything other than that. So it didn't bother me, but as an adult, Elisa, I'm so grateful yeah. because what it has done is it helped me be able to communicate with anybody from all different walks of life, no matter what race, creed, religion, gender, you know, none of that stuff matters because I've probably met someone very similar, maybe similar characteristics to whoever it is I'm speaking with, or more importantly, it just really gave me the ability to tune in, to become really mindful about people and how they're receiving my message. And, you know, because again, I'm always the one having to adjust. And yeah. So as a little girl, completely clued us to it. Right. <laughs> but as an adult, so incredibly grateful for it. Yeah. It's one of those things that feels like a hardship at the time. And then mm -hmm. when you look back on it, it's really, I bet created the strategic agility that you have as an executive, which is yes, yes. you can have moving, changing parts all the yep. time, but you have to not only survive, but thrive with right. that change. Exactly. And you know, what's really interesting. It's funny that you said that because as an adult, that is probably my superpower is that I can adapt very quickly and change is my friend, right? I've never been afraid of change or shied away from change. And so I actually probably run more towards change uh, than most. And uh, so there's that. And then there's also too growing up, I mean, let's face it, we've got, you know, the world's best military, right? Our men and women that serve in and, in, in and out every day of their lives to protect us, uh, certainly deserve every praise and recognition we can ever give them. And growing up as a little girl, being around that, I always say I grew up around excellence. And so again, that shaped who I am as, a, yeah. as an executive. But you know what I mean by that is when you think of our men and women in the, in the armed forces, you don't see them sloppy right? You don't right. see them like right. their shoes are dusty with holes in it. Like you don't see that. <laughs> you don't see their pants all wrinkled up unless it's their fatigues, right? But when they're in uniform, those pants are creased, those shoes are shined, they're fit, they speak with authority, they're not a hair is out of place, like excellence in the details, right? And so when I think of just for myself now as an executive, and you can ask anybody who's ever worked on my team with me, you yeah. know, or led me or what have you, I demand excellence, not perfection, right? Because yeah. like we're never going to hit that. But I do demand excellence. If we're going to do it, do it right. Do it yes. right the first time. If you're going to speak, you know, say something, ladies, never be in the room and not say something. Now, don't talk just for the sake of talking, but <laughs> make sure that when you speak, that people hear what you've got to say. So you use your entire body language. So I could go on and on, Elisa. I can, I'm sorry, I didn't even answer your question, but I wanted to say that no, I think growing not, up with that level of yeah. excellence and seeing it as a little girl and not knowing anything different, again, I'm extremely humbled and grateful because that has been a huge part of who I am as a, as a leader. And, and I believe one of the main reasons I was able to, you know, get so far in an industry that has not been very, you know, uh, known for being very welcoming for women or people of color and things of that nature. Do you, are you able to spot the, 
um, the children of the military? Are you able to um, kind of see them in the crowd and say they're different because of <laughs> what you just described? Well, you know what? It's so funny because if, if I don't, a lot of times I do because us military kids, depending on how long your parents were yeah. in yeah. and because some, you know, my dad was in for well over 25, 26 years. Uh-huh. So my whole life was that. But one of the things that we will tend to do when we all get towards each other or we know like we're a military brat is we'll joke about the silliest things that most people take for granted. So for an example, for myself, I cannot answer most security questions when you're doing anything in banking, right? Like if you're, you know, applying for, you know, a new bank account or, you know, credit card or whatever. And they start asking you questions like, who was your third grade teacher? Yeah. Like, like, I had like two I, third grade teachers. I don't know, right? <laughs> right. Right. Or, you know, what street were you, you know, did you live on when you were little? It's like, yeah, I, I had a lot of streets, you know? Okay. So I feel like for military kids, honestly, who's ever listening, who has the ability to change this, I think for military kids, they should just let us make up our own questions because every question they ask us, it's actually really hard to answer because wow. we've not had a normal life that can say, you know, yeah. um, you know, where did you well, go to elementary school? And it points out something that I think is really um, interesting, which mm-hmm. is if you haven't moved throughout right. your life, but particularly during your childhood, mm-hmm. um, you really haven't had that level of adjustment mm-hmm. that drives this different perspective, not better or worse, just different. Yep. And yep. Um, it's hard to move and it's hard to move yes. as a teenager. Yes. And you kind of take your life for what you think it is. Like mm-hmm. that's the only thing out there. Right. And um, I think that does, does lead to some really interesting, like I said, um, ability for you to lead. So let's go into leadership questions. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously impacted by your upbringing, but also your values and what's important to you. Certainly mm-hmm. excellence. Um, you went into aviation and we sort of understand that because of your background, but you also specifically went into growth and yeah. selling and mm-hmm. driving literally change because sales mm-hmm. is about creating a change for someone else that they decide that they're going to do and pay for. Yes. Yes. Um, I like that. Preach girl. <laughs> it's true. So it's tell true. us around your, your, your desire to go into sales and why that was good for you. Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. So when I first started out in aviation, so you're right, it's, it makes, if, if I would have gotten into anything other than aviation based on my background, you know, that would be the story, right? So me being in aviation makes complete sense. Me being in sales didn't at the time make complete sense, right? Because I knew that I wanted to be in aviation, but because as a little girl, I would always see, you know, whether it's TV or magazines or film, anything depicted with aviation, it always showed if you were a man, you were a pilot, right? Mm -hmm. If you were a woman, you were a flight attendant, right? But none of those pictures, and I'm talking almost 40 years ago, right? None of those pictures ever looked like anyone like me. So as a person of color, I honestly didn't know what I could do in aviation. So I started out loading luggage, parking planes at the Boston Logan Airport. That's what I did when I first got into the industry um, is I actually started out in operations. And by the way, love the job. And you know why? Because back 40 years ago, there wasn't that many women working on the ramp, right? They wow. were parking planes and loading yeah. luggage. And so yeah. I was probably one of a handful of women back then working at the entire Boston Logan Airport <laughs> downstairs on the ramp. Most of the people were men. A majority of the people were men. But because I grew up a child of a soldier, I was used to being around men all the time. So it didn't phase me, right? I felt very much at home. Now, what I would do, because at least I was broke, like I, you know, I was one of those people that just was, you know, always, I I worked for an airline. So I was traveling all over the place. I had no money, right? (laughs) It was all over the place. And so to earn extra money, I would go upstairs and work in customer service. So at the ticket counter. So checking people in for their flights, loading up the flight, all that stuff. And so one gentleman, his name was Jim Vipperman. I'll never forget him. He was a VP at the time for the airline that I worked for. The airline is now American Airlines, but at the time it was a different airline. And, um, and so he would come into the city of Boston to do business you know, frequently. And so one day he pulled me aside. I was working at the ticket counter. He pulled me aside and he said, Steph, I got to tell you, every time I come into this city, you're one of the few people that I see at the ticket counter serving the customers, smiling, you know, engaging with them, um, just really pleasant. I think you should be in sales. 
And I, right. So I knew nothing about sales. I didn't know what right. sales people right. did. But he, 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 he um, saw something. spotted your talent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so because I knew nothing about sales, I started, and this is something really important for the listeners. I didn't know anything about sales. I trusted Jim, right? Um, and I respected Jim. So if he said I should be in sales, I at least thought yeah. that I should do some due diligence on that. So then what I did is I called up the salespeople, introduced myself, asked if I could do ride-alongs with them so I could get an understanding of what salespeople did. And I would do that in you know my free time, right? It wasn't like anybody was paying me to do that. So I did that so I could understand what it is that they do and then see if I felt like I could do a good job at it, sure, right? Sure. And so then from there, I went ahead and started to interview, ended up getting a job in sales. And my very first sales job, at least I was 25 years old. They gave me a quota of $25 million. Mind you, I know nothing about sales. And so, But that was my very first job selling for, uh, at the time it was US Air. And now, of course, it's American Airlines. But uh, then, then the rest is history. I became yeah. number one salesperson there. Then, you know, started to oversee sales teams, then get recruited to uh, into private aviation, right? So left the airlines, moved into private aviation, became really known for my leadership style. And, you know, the rest is history in regards to where I am now. Well, you've built on everything that you've learned and you, you kind of stayed in that industry to keep getting better at it mm -hmm. and uh, with broader responsibility. The most um, crazy thing I heard in that story is that you were in the back park in the plains. Well, that's <laughs> pretty cool. Like, you know, you're selling something you know how to do, which is, yes. which is really amazing. Yes. Um, what? So you were comfortable around all these men and, mm -hmm. um, and I'm expecting that to, well, I don't know to what degree um, the men were diverse in terms of the color of their skin mm. and where they came from. So maybe yeah. tell us a little bit about that. You might not have seen any women and you sounds like you certainly didn't see any women of color. Mm -hmm. um, did you see men of color and did you feel like there was um, some representation there or no? Yeah, it's that's it's I've never been asked that question. And so therefore, I've never really thought about it. You're good. You're good, Alisa. Uh, but as I think about it, no, there wasn't a lot of diversity as far as the men were concerned down there. Huh. There was, you know, a sprinkle here and there. Right. But not uh, by any stretch was it diverse down there in the ramp. So, yeah, that's really interesting. It's a very so, interesting point. So one thing I want to point out too, Stephanie, that you did a good job with and and I would say I'm blessed with this as well. Um, there was someone who spotted your talent early on mm -hmm. and he tapped you on the shoulder and you were a good follower to figure out what's he talking about and what might this mean to me. And, you know, we, we, that sponsorship and the interest yeah. from others and, you know, Hey, life is full then much more so than now, but still now powerful men. Right. <laughs> and right. so, you know, those, they are our allies. He was, yes. Jim was your ally to say, mm -hmm. I recognize this talent. And you were savvy and smart enough to fig to to follow that, mm -hmm. and and then forge your own path. Um, and some of us today are in the position to be that gym, right? Tap someone on the shoulder and say, "Hey, I see this. Why don't, why don't we go explore it?" So that seems like it was a massive milestone for it you. It really was. It was. It was pivotal. And at the time, you know, you never. You wake up. You go to work every day. You just never know when you have those pivotal moments. And to yeah. your point, Lisa, you do have to seize them because what I could have done is just like, oh, thanks, Jim, and then yeah. done something different, yeah. right? And I probably still yeah. be working on the ramp. <laughs> but you know, but because he saw something in me and I respected him, yeah, um, that's what made me do something. And you're you're right now, even now, right? You know, as as women who have, you know, I, I've I'm quite frankly, I've hit, you know, the, probably the pinnacle of my career, right? And so, but I've had a lot of great allies and supporters and a lot of the men along yeah. the way who yeah. saw something in me. And then, you know, and now here's what's really interesting and something that I think we, we, could, we could talk about uh, just between us girls, right? Is, you know, women are different. The way that we think, the way that we see things, the way that we lead, like everything about us is, is, is very different than usually how men um, historically have done things. And so when, 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 we're, when we're interacting with them and when men, you know, see something and then want to, you know, continue to cultivate that, we as women have to be mindful of our communication styles are different, 
Uh Right. uh And so men, men are like, listen, men are like usually to the point, you know, all the emotions kind of ripped out. Right. (laughs) They're just like focused on, you know, the yes or no. Right. Whereas we women, we want to know there's a lot, there's a lot more to our communication and it's actually a gift. So we should never shy away from it. But it's just one of those things that when I think about the men allies that I've had, yeah, they were, they loved me enough to tell it to me straight. Right. And if they found that there was something that I needed to improve on, they would tell me that. Yeah. If they felt that I was really good in a particular area, they would tell me that as well. But it would come out direct. Right. So, so Stephanie, what would you be your advice, for example? um, You know, all those things you said are are so true. Mm -hmm. How do you ask? What if, how do you ask for help? How do you ask that man in power? you know, to see something maybe he didn't, he hasn't seen. I mean, it could be a woman in power too, but really on this thread of, you know, you're lucky, lucky, you know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean by that, yeah. that, that you were, you were seen by someone who could be proactive. Mm-hmm. And sometimes our communications or styles are different. It's okay to ask. Yes. How do you do that? How do you yes. ask and yes, make, that- it, make it comfortable for you and him? We're getting into the good stuff because I believe that in, in, in life in general, never say something if you can ask it, right? So you always make it a question. So to your specific question, how do you ask, you know, someone to, to whether it's mentorship, sponsorship, you know, yeah. uh, or what have you, right? Allyship. The way that I've always looked at it is, is to approach it in a more of a question, Because, and and let's actually spend some time with this, Lisa, because you and I, I'm sure, get asked to be mentors a lot, right? And the truth of the matter is not everybody, you know, one, we can't, if we're going to be effective, we can't mentor everybody, but not, and not everybody is uh, mentorable, (laughs) if that's a word, right? That's true. Yeah, yeah. And so you really have to know, you have to know yourself so well. So how I would suggest to people that they go about, um, you know, whether it's a sponsor or a mentor or an ally is ask the question and the questions that you're going to want to ask is not, will you be my mentor? That's not necessarily the question, right? Right. The question is, so let's say I was talking to you, Elisa, and and I looked at you and I saw where you're at and I just like totally admired your, your vibe and everything that you're doing. And so I would say to you, you know, Elisa, I would, I would love to be able to ask you a couple of questions. The first one, and you assuming you said yes, right. (laughs) Then I would really go along the lines of it's my desire to really, you know, stay in this company, grow in this company, you know, and be X, Y, Z. But I know that where I'm at now, there's a lot of steps in between. And would you be okay if I could ask you, you know, you've known my work, we've worked together for many years. What are the things that you see that I'm doing that is really good and going to get me in a good position to get there? But more importantly, what are the things that you're seeing that I'm not doing that I need to grow in? that I should, you know, really step back and, and embrace or grow more in or, or whatever, right? So you really want to ask, you want to spend more time asking people for the negative than the positive, right? Yeah, what, that's what awesome. Is most that, people will go, you're great. You're fantastic. Yeah, you know, I, I could see you there. And you, it's like, okay, that, that doesn't help me at all, right? Really what you want to know is, that's great. I'm glad that you can see me there. But what are those things that you think are my blind spots that are going to hold yeah. me back from not being able to get there? You know, so I appreciate the positives, but I'd love to really, I yeah. believe nothing, like and I'll tell you this, I don't think anything grows on top of the mountain. I think all the beautiful flowers grow in the valley uh-huh. where it's rocks and it's stones and it's, you know, there's, there's friction and all kind of stuff. That's where our real growth happens. And so we've got to be, you know, big girl enough, right? Put our big girl pants on to have that type of conversation. What is it that I could do better? Where is it that I'm not, very, I'm not hitting it out the park? You know, I really, and then you listen and you learn and you execute, right? Yeah. You adjust accordingly. So I heard two things there. One, mm-hmm. you made very clear, which was ask about the negative and have thick skin yeah. to hear it because it's the only way you're going to grow and develop. Awesome. Yes. The other thing I heard you say is when you ask people a question that they're likely, why would you ask people a question that they're likely to say no to? This is mm-hmm. your scales, your sales skills coming, yes. coming forward. Mm-hmm. Will you be my mentor? Well, if I don't know you, right. even if I admire you and I have a full plate and all of that, your likely answer is I'm sorry, but no. Right. Your likely answer to, can I ask you a couple questions? Who mm-hmm. says no to that? 
Exactly. So, exactly. That's, that was really good. Yeah. You, and you know what? I mean, even something as simple, because you can mentor people from afar, right? So, you know, if we're on LinkedIn, because again, you know, it, it's, and the reason why we may say no is, we, one, we don't know them, but two, you know, we take it seriously, right? Yeah. And so I don't want to, you know, disappoint anybody or, 100%. you know, have, have them go now or not give them enough time, you know, yeah. all those things. But being able to ask a question, I, when I'm speaking or, you know, whatnot, and people will come up to me and, and say, and say, you know, will you be my mentor or what have you? I always say, listen, here's what I can do, you know, cause I'm, I'm swamped, right? No, I can't meet for coffee. No, I can't right. be a mentor. No, I, you know, all those things that come at us, right? But what I can do is if you're on LinkedIn, you want to ask me a question, I, I shoot me a private, I'll yeah. answer that, right? Now yeah. be concise and, you know, to the point, right? But, um, but I'll answer it that way. So you don't have to have a mentor that's there with you to have coffee every single week. Yeah. You can actually get mentorship from afar on yeah. various different ways. And so well, yes, just, asking the question is the key. You, you know? actually just gave me some great advice because mm -hmm. I always get, when someone asks me that, I, mm -hmm. I'm, I always get so nervous because I'm trying to figure out how to say no nicely because I yes. my plate is full mm -hmm. and all the reasons you said, I'm not going to do a good mm -hmm. job, et cetera. But right. now you gave me a new answer. Next time mm -hmm. someone asks me, Hey, Lisa, we've been mentor. I'm going to say, I would love to be able to know what's on your mind. Do you have anything yes. you, you want to talk about in the next 14, right. you know, 15, 20 minutes? Cause I have mm -hmm. time right now. I That's just right. said yes, yes to something they didn't ask me for, but could right. be valuable. So boom, you're, yes. you're awesome, Stephanie. Boom. Okay. Can I, can I talk about not about learning how to say no, Elisa, because this is one of the things that I, whenever I get an opportunity, I always say this because I think we women struggle with saying no, we do, we really do. And if you're, you know, you're, you're serious about your career and you really want to you know, live to your fulfillment or to your potential, right? Live yeah, up to yeah. your potential. You want to perform at your potential, um, et cetera. And you may or may not know what that is right now. And that's okay. Right. But one thing for sure, bigger level, bigger devil. So the higher up you go, <laughs> so you true. have to learn how to say no, yeah. because there's going to be more demands on your life. And you'll so fail I would you yes fail. Everything. And I wish I would have learned this at a, you know, younger in my, right, earlier right. in my career, I, I should say, which is why I'm so passionate about making sure people know about it as soon as they can, because we women are going to go through stages, right? We, we may get a partner, we may, you know, um, have kids, we may, you know, have to throttle back our career because of the family life. I mean, there's a lot of different obstacles that we'll face that, you know, typically men won't necessarily have to face, right? And so learning how to say no and not being so proud of the fact that you can juggle 16 gazillion things, right? <laughs> That's not necessarily good. So how I say no, and what when I say no, it's because it doesn't, whatever it is that someone's asking me to do, it doesn't line up with what it is that I'm focused on doing, right? I'm very purpose driven. I'm here for a reason. I'm here to get, you know, make significant change in the world. And so I'm focused. Right. And so if people ask me to do things that don't line up with my vision, my focus, my purpose, my answer is no. Right. But how I say no is the most important part. So okay. here's a lesson for everybody. And this, you can, you can copy it and make it your own. I say this every day. Okay. If you asked me to do something, at least so that I didn't have any desire to do, um, because it didn't line up to what it is I'm called to do. I would simply say to you, Elisa, thank you so much for, you know, that opportunity. And I really appreciate you thinking about me, but unfortunately I'm not going to be able to do it, but thank you so much for thinking of me. Nevertheless. Yeah. Very nice. Done. I got a slap a smile on my face and we're finished. Right. Yeah. Now what I do, firm. It's, it's pretty firm. firm. I don't yeah. give people because what we women will do is like, Oh God, I like, uh, let me think about it. You know, I, I don't think I'll be able to, is that okay? Um, you know, maybe next week. I mean, maybe if I can juggle some things around, you know, maybe you can call me next week. This is like crazy, right? Because first of all, if you don't want to do it now, you don't want to do it next week. <laughs> yeah. So, and then you don't need to give people excuses. Like my kids are grown and you know, all that stuff. It's like, just say no. Yeah. It's easier for the receiver because then they can move on to go find somebody else who can do it. And it's easier for you. You don't have to go through the mental gymnastics of, I don't want their feelings hurt. How do I not make them feel bad? You know, all that stuff that we women tend to do. Well, clarity, so simple clarity provides your, the ability to act. Um, yes. And so a clear no to mm -hmm. me is important uh -huh. because then I know I have to go pursue something else if I still right. want to stick with that goal. Yes. And, and so that's awesome. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that um, we've talked about on Speak Her Mind as women 
have achieved these new levels for women, mm -hmm. whether it's the type of role that you've been playing or whether it's uh, sitting on boards, et cetera. The other thing I would add to what you yes. said is, mm -hmm. you know, thank you so much for thinking of me and I can't do it right now. I wish you great luck. If it's applicable, who else, who, who can I yes. recommend for you? Because we yes. have to help lift each other. So That's maybe right. I don't have time right now, but I know Stephanie. Well, I know yes. you don't have time, but yeah. you know. <laughs> um, I know I know Susan mm -hmm. is actually looking for, but let me introduce you to her. Yes. And so we yes. lift each other when we say no, if there's an opportunity to do a referral, that's awesome. That is excellent. That's an excellent point, Elise. I'm going to steal that and start adding that to, <laughs> to my answer because you're right. You know, we women, especially when you think of like board work, I, and I know you and I have talked about this before, a lot of it is who you know, right? It may it not is. work for you, but it may be for somebody else. So excellent advice. That's excellent addition. So let's talk a little bit more. I want to talk a little bit more about um, your leadership, and then I want to move into um, some, some, um, talk about women and, and mm -hmm. confidence. Um, but on your leadership, so you didn't see a lot of people like you. You didn't sure. see a lot of people like you at your level above you. Mm -hmm. You didn't see a lot of people like you, not only with your upbringing, but also um, your background. And you've now risen to the top. Mm -hmm. And you have the ability in, in your position to influence change around who is in this industry. Yeah. And do we have people of color and do we have a gender mix and do we have, um, right. you know, all of the different types of um, uh, underrepresented communities that want to be, you know, yes. obviously, you know, moving along in their careers as well. Tell us about what you do to sponsor that, promote that, make that happen because yeah. you've been extraordinarily influential. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And, you know, it's, 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 it's really, when I talked about passion and purpose, right? Um, this is something I'm really passionate about because to your point, growing up in this industry, whether I worked on the commercial airline side or then, you know, moved into the private aviation right. side, and it was really noticeable, it was noticeable in commercial, but it was really noticeable in private aviation that I would oftentimes be the only, right? Yeah, any, of course. In any room, yeah. in any setting. And so the first thing I would say is I, you know, I, I want, I really want women to, to hear this, that you have to think about, you know, when, sometimes we get in our own way with our stinking thinking and all that stuff and, and just the self-doubt and all the things yeah. that come with it. And, and it's okay to be, you know, have imposter syndrome and self-doubt sometimes and all that, but you do want to live to your full potential. And I made that comment earlier. And the reason why that's important is I'm, I'm doing that now, right? I could still be working on the ramp, probably not making a big difference for, you know, yeah. women or people of color and all that. But now I'm in the position that I'm in and I can make a big difference yeah. for women and people of color and all that. So living up to your potential, sometimes you have to, you know, suck it up and do the hard work, not for yourself, but for the, what it is that you're here for to create a difference for everybody else coming up after you. Right. So now to answer your question, Elisa, what I'm able to do now as chief growth officer for, you know, Will's Up, which is the leading, you know, the leading brand in private aviation is I have a platform and I have allyship and support from my CEO, right? Mm -hmm. And also my executive team, my C-suite, my board, all that. We are all focused on diversifying the private aviation industry. So I'm in a, you know, it couldn't be in a better place to do this. And the reason, so what I can do with my platform is to make sure, so, you know, I'll just, let me kind of step back and talk about what I do as chief growth officer. So as chief growth officer for Wills Up, there's really three things that I focus in on. My team and I, our focus is about diversifying the consumer base, right? Okay. You know, we okay. look at Wills Up and we attack it from two, we attack this whole DEI, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging from yeah. several different angles. So me and my group on the growth team, we're looking at it from external. How do we diversify the consumer base? We run alongside HR, who's looking at it internally. How do we make sure we have sure. diverse employees, we have a strong, diverse pipeline, and that we have employees that have a strong career path, right? That if they're female or people of color, or LGBTQ plus, or have uh, disabilities and all that stuff. And so, so we're attacking it, this industry, two different ways when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Now, for me, the platform that I have is I can then speak 
right? In areas like I can speak in industries that people are familiar with the industry as a woman talking about, you know, female things or people of color things. And then I can also speak to other industries that are not familiar with what, right. it, is, what it is that we do to, to broaden the lens, right? So there's two things specifically that I do. Um, one, I'm on what uh, an MBAA board. So it's, it's the National Business Aviation Association. I'm on the advisory council to the board. Okay. And that gives me a platform to be able to look at the entire private aviation industry. And then because I'm at the table, be able to talk about diversity and what is it that we're doing for the female market and what is it, how are we trying to get more, you know, people of color in this industry and, you know, having a voice and because I, you know, I'm, I'm not shy, as you can imagine. So (laughs) I can have a voice and stand strong with, well, here's something that we should think about, or have we thought about this or what are we doing with that? So I'm, I'm at the highest level, you know, as far as our industry is concerned, being able to have those conversations. Also, if you kind of throttle it back a little bit, just being in a a brand of our size, then, you know, we're invited to a lot of different places to speak about a lot of different things. People are very intrigued about uh, private aviation. It's certainly an aspirational industry, right? And so it gives me the ability to talk as well about private aviation or about the things that we're doing in private aviation so that other people, whether it's women, people of color, et cetera, can see, oh, there's someone that looks like me. Maybe I could do this, right? Because my story is not like, you know, rags. My story is crazy. Like if I can do it, literally anybody can do this. And so, so, so I use the platform in different ways. So being on different, um, you know, councils that allow me to speak uh-huh. on behalf of the industry and, and, and really be there to, you know, have the back of women uh, and people of color or LGBTQ plus. So I do that. I also then spend that time speaking um, and, and being a part of things that are not part of our industry, right? So that we can get more people into it. So, and then that may be charity or philanthropic uh, work, right? Using my voice in those arenas. So, so you're, you're basically, you have a very, um, you know, aggressive approach to visibility, and yes. the visibility is really important because mm-hmm. you represent the minority who yeah. has been there and therefore I can see that it can be done. Right. Do you have advice related to how people can ask the right questions in their companies to their head of growth or their mm-hmm. head of HR to instigate positive change that mm-hmm. would drive more um, pipeline for diversity? Yeah, that's a good question. Really, you have to have the you have to have the the conversation based on numbers and data, right? Because that's how you speak the language of business. And so, though we all know that diversification is the right thing to do, which I kind of hate that saying, um, we know it's the right thing to do, but businesses are for profit, right? So when you're talking about the reasons why you want to diversify, besides the fact that it's the right thing to do, that's like so obvious, right? Is you also want to attach the numbers and sense to it because that's when you'll get people who typically may not be listening to listen. Because Because you're going to get a better outcome, better business. Exactly. You're going to get a better business result. You're going to have a more, you know, productive team that's going to be able to produce better product, get that, you know, competitive advantage, et cetera. And so that's what I would encourage people to do is to, is to really do the research, to know the numbers and then the numbers help guide the conversation. So I'll give them an example, right? Just for everybody's sake to kind of make sure we're on alignment. If you think about the census, the new census has come out in 2020. So, you know, the census is done every 10 years and the new census is quite telling, actually. Um, So in 2020, when you look at the new census, what it's basically showing is that the buying power of the multicultural segments is like five point four trillion dollars. That's a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about the the growth of the uh, population for the United States, the only growth that has happened has been in multicultural segments. The segment that is actually decreasing in size is white, non-Hispanic. And so when you think about diversifying, right, whether it's your product, your service, your consumer base, your employee base, what have you, the world is changing, (laughs) right? Women are now the majority, not the minority. So everything's changing. And so really for businesses, we really have to be mindful that if we want to be here for the long run, we're going to have to make the necessary changes as well. And there are some industries, like I know 
I've had some really great conversations with um, like, you know, different entities within the golf industry, for an example, and the golf industry or the, you know, forest industry and industries that typically were just geared towards a certain uh, demographic or a certain right. type are finding that as the demographics are changing, yeah. they had better wise up, right, and find ways to invite um, and broaden the lens and have more people come in that you have historically ignored, right? Well, um, and to your point, mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. It's of course the right thing to do, but how can you possibly market and sell to a segment that you're not a part of and no one in your company is a part of? You can't yes. understand that from reading the data. You have to understand that from having that person, yes. that, that community as a yep. part of your organization. So Stephanie, well, I, I, you, but can I elaborate on one point, Alyssa, because you just hit something. I heard, and you guys can find this on YouTube. I, I watched a little snippet of an interview that Denzel Washington did. And they were asking him, why is diversity needed in you know, yeah. film, right? Yeah. And he said, it's not about color, it's about culture which uh -huh. is what you're talking about, yeah. right? So he said, you know, if you look at the movie, um, you know, Goodfellas, Martin Sikorsky did that and Steven Spielberg could have done it and probably done a really good job. If you look at Schindler's List, you know, Steven Spielberg did that, right? Martin Sikorsky could have done it, probably done a good job, but it wasn't about color. It was about culture, right? right? Steven right. Identity. Spielberg, Identity, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the cultural mm -hmm. appreciations and all those little nuances. And so sometimes that's hard to pick up in, you know, yeah. marketing or sales or what have you, you have to understand it and know it. And therefore the engagement with your consumer and customer is very different. That's if so you true. culturally can connect, yeah. it's not it's so much about color, but color is important too, but, but the real thing is the cultural appreciation and cultural connection that some things you can't Describe. No, it's right? just a it's a part of who you are. So yes. that that that's a great great insight. Um, mm -hmm. I want to. I I can't believe how the time is going by. So I got to <laughs> ask you this. I want you to have time to talk about this, which is, okay. you know, all of the women who participate in this forum, mm -hmm. they're interested in self improvement. We're all interested yeah. in being better, learning lessons, helping each other. And so with that, you know, it's pretty obvious after, you know, almost an hour together, everyone on this call knows you have a tremendous amount of self-confidence. You know, you, you can articulate your feelings and your approach very clearly. You can back it up with the data. You have kind of all of it wrapped up. When did you have moments of self-doubt? Did you experience imposter syndrome and how did you deal with that. Give us mm -hmm. a little bit of, of that, because I think that's of great yes. interest. I love that. I love that. And so, uh, you know, I probably had self-doubt like, you know, 10 minutes ago, right? <laughs> so like self-doubt is one of those things that you always have to deal with. You, you should be, because as you're growing and really trying to be better, right, and live up to your full potential, there are going to be areas that you're going to step into that you just didn't know, right? right, or you're not familiar with, or, you know, every new job that you get into, you're not, hopefully, you don't, there's a lot of things you don't know about the job, right? If you know everything about the job, you're overqualified, and that's not the job for you, right? Agreed. So self-doubt and imposter syndrome is just an everyday norm. What I would encourage people to always do is, to embrace it though. A lot of times what holds people back is they, they, they don't embrace it. They just, the, the fear almost overtakes them and they don't step into it. Right. And so then they just kind of, you know, live, live a mediocre um, existence because they didn't have the courage to do those things that were scary. And so imposter syndrome, one of the areas that I had imposter syndrome was when I first became a president. Uh, so before I joined Wills Up, I was the president of a large private aviation company. And that was my, probably the one that I remember the most. And the reason why, Elisa, is because my background was sales, right? Yeah. So as I yeah. came in the ranks of, you know, private aviation, once Jim moved me over to the sales side, I sold in the airlines, whether it's, you know, commercial selling, leisure selling, then moved into private aviation, selling charter, overselling, overseeing teams that sold actual aircraft and so on and so forth. So sales is my strength. But- when I first took over as president of this company, it's, I'm not just taking over the sales team, right? It it's like a lot of other things. It's a lot of other stuff. You now have to oversee maintenance and operations and pilots and, you know, all these other things, right? 
And those were not areas that were my specialty. Yeah. Um, and they weren't my strong point. And they were primarily men dominated parts of the industry. And so my imposter syndrome, I remember when I um, had the job offer and I just remember thinking, how are they going to like, I'm not a pilot. I listen in aviation, you know, I don't fix the planes. I don't fly the planes. Okay. I've never been a pilot, never been a maintenance person. Uh, and yet those are two really pivotal uh, roles in our space. And right. so for me, that was where imposter syndrome really set in. And I really had to step back and think, how are they going to accept me? Are they going to listen to me because I'm not a pilot? Right. Do you, are they going to feel like she doesn't know what she's talking about? Cause she didn't know how to fix a plane. She right. probably can't even tell this wrench from that wrench. Right. And all those things that come with it. And so, so yes, I have experienced imposter syndrome and what I did to overcome that is I remember one of the very first conversations I had with all the employees, um, but then I segmented out pilots, uh, all the ones that I knew I didn't have a strength in, right? So yeah. pilots, maintenance, and talked to operations separately from all the employees when I first got there. And then I just threw it out there. Listen, guys, I don't fly them, I don't fix them. And so, but here's what I do know how to do, right? And so then start talking about your strengths, right? As a salesperson, I know how to generate revenue. Yeah. I know how to, you know, get us to a brand that people talk about, right? Like there's things that I bring to the table beyond what which are good for them. Looking at, they're they're good very for them. good for them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so imposter syndrome is something that we all have. I would tell everybody, embrace it. Don't run away from it. You only get better when you embrace it. Um, and then those things that you can fix, fix them. And those things that you're just not, it's not going to be your superpower. Like I never want to learn how to fly a plane. It's never been my thing. I, I think one flying lesson, got out the plane, threw up and decided I'll never do this again. Right. <laughs> so it's not my thing. It would be but, nice to be on the private jet. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll sit in the know. back all the time, right. <laughs> <laughs> all day till Sunday. And so, but, but what I will say is when you're, when you're in that situation, you know, what I found to be helpful was communicating, being vulnerable enough to know and to say, guys, I'm going to really be counting on you yeah. because I don't know how to fly an aircraft or fix an aircraft. Here's what I know how to do. Here's what you know how to do. And together we're going to create something special, right? And, and over communicating that to people is good. You don't have to know everything. And that's those, where we hold ourselves back. How right? do those skills and the ability to be vulnerable, how did that help you deal with the news that you had cancer? Mm. So, you know what? And I remember the day I had to pull my team together and talk about the fact that I had cancer and that I was, you know, going to be out of pocket for, you know, a while. And so, you know, but being vulnerable, one of the best things you can do in life is to be vulnerable. Because I think that we all, and I think more than ever after the pandemic, or I think we're still in it, but um, 2020 has taught us a lot. Yeah. And, you know, what it's taught us is to value human connection because it's not promised, right? Um, well, it's and it can us, get taken away. It can get taken away, mm -hmm, you know? So mm -hmm. we've hopefully learned a ton going through this whole thing. But being vulnerable, you know, even as a professional speaker, the best speakers are the ones who are vulnerable. Because if you're not, when you get on stage, people are gonna look and go, well, yeah, of course she's doing it because she's this, that, and the other. I could yeah. never do it. And the whole purpose of being a speaker is to let people know, here's all the crazy stuff that's happened to me. And if I can happen, if it can work for me, it can work, it for, work you, for you, right? Yeah. That's the whole point. So vulnerability when I was going through cancer um, was important because I had to rely on everybody else. You know, I had what the doctor called drive-by cancer, meaning there was no cancer in my family. There's no reason why I should have had cancer, but I believe in that particular season of my life, I probably, I was so stressed out that yeah, I think I probably I induced the cancer, you know, it was during the economy, 2008, the economy had dropped, you know, I was in private jets, selling private jets, nobody's buying a private jet when there's a recession going on. And so there was just, you know, it was a lot of stresses that were going on. Uh, and then plus some things went on personally. So yes, I ended up with cancer. But being vulnerable, when now all of a sudden, you have to have your teenage daughter who has to feed you, right, or your husband who has to help clean your wounds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the drainage situation and all that. And so you really have to start relying on everybody else. And most women, most of us are like super women and no, I can do it. Add more to my plate. I got this. And so I had to completely, it was a complete flip that I had to go through. And I can tell you now, um, it was probably one of the best things in my life. Right. Well, Not it sounds like cancer, but the, the no, things I that understand. came out of it, you know, because it sounds like you, you accepted the turn of the tables and, and 
and the help of your family, yes. your friends and your support system to get you through it so that mm-hmm. you could get through it. Because this yes. wasn't one of the things that you were just going to keep charging along like right. Stephanie always does and yes. get the next thing done. So yep. thank you for that. The vulnerability Absolutely. and the, um, and the uh, ability to let other people help when you've mm-hmm. helped so many, it's hard to change hard. those goals. So, so yeah. we're so happy that that worked for you. <laughs> um, Stephanie, you. I don't think I ever told you this, but um, uh, at one point I was in, you know, the green room before mm-hmm. I was going to do a keynote and, you know, you're just, these are the worst times. I think you're a great uh-huh. keynote speaker. So it's probably great for you, but, <laughs> but the worst times are like 15 minutes before you go on. Cause, mm-hmm. because your prep is all done. Yes. You know what you're going to say. You've practiced, yep. you know, the, like everything's done. You got these 15 minutes of nothing. Yes. And I hated that downtime. And one Uh of the times I was in the green room and during those 15 minutes that I was just cruising around the web, like, come on, are they, when are they going to call me on? I want to get this (laughs) thing over with. I came across this article called six confidence boosters that any businesswoman can start using right now. I read that before I went on stage. And the very (laughs) first thing for those on the call, you need to look this article up or maybe one of the speaker mind um, team members can post it to the chat. The very first thing you talk about is the power pose. Mm. And I was in the green room and I'm like, well, I got nothing else to do. (laughs) And so I did it. I stood up all by myself in the green room, you know, and, and I did the power pose right before I went on stage. Yes. God damn, I killed it that day. (laughs) You go girl. I killed it. So I want you to talk about very quickly. We have just a few minutes left, but the six confidence boosters and, and trust me, I've been watching my posture (laughs) during this, during this particular zoom. So what are the six confidence boosters? We well, can do in, today. In, today. Yes, I was going to say today because that article was like so long ago. So I don't even remember the six that I mentioned then. But but what, what, what I would say is this. The power poses, it's really interesting. It's so interesting, right? Because whenever I get ready to speak, oh, whether it's big or small or what have you, is I get... <laughs> is you do have to get your mind in the right space, right? You're right. The last 15 minutes, my team, they're so amazing. They know I have certain habits before I get ready, especially when I'm doing a keynote and I'll disappear for like, you know, the hour before or what have you. And then because I'm trying to get into my own head, right? So I'm trying to cut the noise yeah, from everything yeah. else because I really want to serve the audience. And so, so yes, a, a lot of it is like, you know, what, whatever it is that gets you in that zone, but a simple thing is the pose, or even when you're sitting in a, in a room full of people and you're the only ladies, right? Don't, whatever you do, don't sit like, you know, like, like that kind of, that's just not it. I mean, grab your spot and be there with complete authority and command because you wouldn't be in the room if someone didn't see value of what you could add to the room. So yeah. you have to get into your own mindset and the mindset is so important with confidence. You have to know what you know, what you know, and being vulnerable gives you that ability ability to be okay with the things you don't know, right? Because there's confidence in going, actually, you know what, Elisa, I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question, but let me see if I can get that answer, right? There's power in that as well. So being able to, one, I would tell people a couple of things. One, the power pose for sure. Two, learning how to ask questions, right? Again, learning how to ask questions is, is probably one of my biggest superpowers and the thing I encourage people to do all the time. Because asking questions allows you to, A, spot check and make sure it wasn't you who heard it the wrong way, yeah, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but then the second piece is to be able to, you know, by asking questions, you allow people to build trust with you, strangely enough, right? Like, you know, you talked about my book, um, you know, uh, Profit Like a Girl, A Woman's Guide to Kick and Butt in Sales and Leadership. But I also have a product called Neuroscience Selling. And, and, and when I do speeches, sometimes I talk about neuroscience leadership. It's all about how does the brain show up in a conversation? And so asking questions is a form of actually building trust, uh-huh. right? Asking questions and listening to the, the person is, is, a, is a trust building and chemicals get, chemical cocktails get created in the brain when that's happening. So what I would just say is pose for sure, but there's so much in just your thought process and how you carry yourself and how you speak and don't be apologetic for everything, right? Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Be very clear and articulate when you're saying something. When I lead teams, they always say, you got to suck it up and take it like a man if you're (laughs) being led by Stephanie, because I'm very direct in my feedback. 
right? Yeah. And what that means is if you're doing a great job, I'm going to tell you that. Alyssa, I loved what you're doing. And let me tell you specifically why it is that I, I love the fact that you did this and what that meant, you know, and I'm going to give you specifics. If I didn't like what you were doing, that's going to be just as clear. You know what? I feel like we missed the mark there. And let me be really clear. Here's where I really need you to get better. Yeah. And here's why. Right. So being very clear. So everybody is not like wandering around like, well, what does she mean by that? Just clarity adds so much simplicity to your life. So right? you, you've given us some really awesome advice today. <laughs> and one of the things with speaker mind is we always try to focus with our amazing guests. You know, what are the, what are the kind of micro actions we can take to either better ourselves or better those around us? And you've given, given us a whole jar full today. <laughs> I love the, the, you know, clarity provides the ability to take action. Yeah. Instead of being left in the middle or the gray. So clarity yeah. and you do, and, and doing that well. Mm -hmm. um, and I brought up the six confidence boosters because they are something that you can literally get off this call now and give the yes. power pose a try and see how you feel for the next hour. <laughs> Cause it, 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 it definitely gets something going there in the brain. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, you've been, and thank you to our, um, to our participants today. We've had yes. uh, a number just hang through the entire hour of conversation um, really appreciate the commentary. You got some great commentary here from a oh, couple cool. of folks who had to drop off early, but are going to listen to mm -hmm. the recording because they enjoyed uh, hearing the beginning of it. And Indira posted the link to the six. Um, oh, good. So that's awesome. Um, we couldn't say thank you enough, Stephanie, for sharing your stories, your lessons, you. your passion, and teaching us through your communication style what we can do better and be more effective. Um, just a fantastic speaker mind. I'm gonna sign off with Stephanie now. There's a poll here quickly for those of you who are still on the line. We have such a wonderful sponsorship from Namely who um, allows us to, um, in sponsors for this program to happen. So if you wanna learn anything more about Namely or have colleagues who would like to, please uh, take the poll that's on your screen and uh, join me with a huge warm thank you. And we hope to have you back to uh -oh. Stephanie. Time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited. Thank you so much, Elisa. This was fun. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>